This is Street Knowledge with Chris Graham. We are talking with Robert Roy. Robert is director of a documentary called Siege that will be screened at the Wayne Theater in Queensboro on Thursday, September 7th as part of the Orange Screen In-Person Documentary Series. And uh, we'll talk about the subject of the movie. Robert, first, uh, thanks for joining us. Oh, you're, you're very welcome. So Siege is, is a look at the life um, of, of, a, of a young man named DJ Savary. And uh, DJ, uh, DJ is, is, is someone with, he's a non-speaking autistic. You follow him all the way through what, it looks like high school, college, um, and, and help tell his story. And I say help tell his story because DJ is also telling this story uh, with you, Robert, as a co-equal. Tell me about uh, DJ and how this, this whole project came about. Sure. Uh, I grew up on a farm in Iowa, and while I was out there visiting family, I uh, I first heard of this family living in Grinnell, Iowa, just 20 minutes down the road. And I got interested enough to just reach out and connect. It just really sounded like a, a, a very moving story. And um, so I connected, uh, ha- ended up having a three-hour conversation with DJ's dad, actually, in a coffee shop. And uh, we hit it off, and then gradually, very gradually, I started uh, spending time with DJ. And the idea originally was just to to give us a slice of his life to see how he navigated through a regular high school, despite the fact that the only way he can he can communicate is one finger at a time on a keyboard. Mm-hmm. And uh, to see that, and just how he managed to matriculate through a a uh, public high school. But as soon as I met him, it be, it was obvious that he had uh, visions of a lot more than just making it through high school. And uh, he felt that he really his mission was to fight for kids like him. Uh, DJ had a really rough beginning to his life. Uh, He was abandoned by his birth parents and then also uh, uh, faced abuse in a foster care situation and then almost miraculously got uh, adopted by this young couple. And uh, they insisted that he be mainstreamed. So from kindergarten on, he was put in a regular uh, high school, but with an aide, or sorry, regular public school, but with an aide. so that he could be involved in regular class activities. And it really took him until he was in fourth grade before language really clicked with him and he and he understood fully how the letters added up to words and how the words added up to sentences. And from there, he has managed to become a, just an exquisite poet. He's nationally published as, as a poet. And we feature four of his poems in the documentary. Mm-hmm. And he he wanted to pursue college as part of his own mission to to advocate for kids like him because his his conviction and I have to say mine too is that all too often children like him are sort of categorized as only at a certain kind of level of intelligence, of capability, and are taught only to that level. And they're not really challenged the way uh, neurotypical uh, so-called normal children are. And in the case of, of uh, DJ, that was certainly the, certainly true. And just in covering DJ uh, over the years, I've met quite a few other um, other people who have a lot to say who – uh, have to do it through an autistic uh, neurology and an autistic body and do so quite eloquently. How long did you spend on this movie project? You know, you from that first initial three-hour meeting with the family, you know, how, how many years did this turn into? Well, m- many more than I anticipated. <laughs> uh-huh. uh, I thought I would just be spending a couple of years with DJ in high school. Sure. I started when he was just a freshman. And then uh, it seemed that the college quest was really going to be an interesting one because we knew of and uh, no other uh, non-speaking autistic who was actually pursuing uh, a 
five, a four-year education at a residential college of the caliber of, of Oberlin, which is mm -hmm. where he ended up going. And so we, we realized that we were, that that was part of his quest and I needed to stay with him until he was uh, securely enrolled in and uh, working on campus in, at Oberlin. Yeah, that's, uh, one of the scenes in the trailer for the documentary is, is of him asking, uh, I guess, a college admissions counselor, how many students um, like him have you ever had before? And I think the answer was none. Uh, so yeah. that was that was I mean not only like you said the the elementary school uh, middle school high school experience public school experience was a challenge yeah then that next level certainly was a challenge because you know as you said no one else of, of his of his uh, w with his background was was even thinking about four year school so um, so yeah that that that, 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 that what did you find in terms of what I mean I don't I don't know if he talked to other schools if he visited other schools. Um, the level of receptivity to to the fact that he he wanted to matriculate on campuses. Yeah, uh, I think that that besides it obviously benefiting DJ that he was mainstreamed into regular classrooms, I think it benefited all the kids he went to grade school, middle school, and high school with, yeah. because they their perception of what someone who acts like and sounds like DJ is radically transformed by virtue of having him as a fellow student. Yeah. You know, there were, we have a kind of saying, a, a, a tagline to the, to the film, inclusion shouldn't be a lottery. And that's uh -huh. really what DJ believes devoutly and I, he's made a believer out of me as well. What kind of impact do you sense that the film is having, the story of DJ is having, uh, now that you know the movie's there and people are able to watch, uh, what kind of impact may this be having on other on other uh, children uh, who who are who are not speaking autistic? Well, we hope a lot. Uh, we've had a tremendous outpouring of interest in, and I think the timing is is right for this film. A lot of people who who touch, are touched by and grapple with the issues of autism and other kinds of uh, of disability, uh, really think that this is a, a film that can help them um, convince others to look at uh, autism in a whole different light and to look at inclusion in a whole different light and uh, really to perhaps even redefine what normal is, mm -hmm. you know, getting rid of old myths and stereotypes uh, um, of what an autistic person is like. Uh, we have labels like uh, low functioning and high functioning labels, and they're really they're really misguided, and they can they can restrict a person's rights. Um, DJ is a case in po in point because he acts differently than most people and sounds differently in terms of some vocal sounds that he makes and so forth. He a lot of people would would write would write him off as being quote unquote low functioning. And instead we have someone here who is a remarkable poet and who just uh, just uh, graduated with with honors from one of the, the most esteemed colleges in the United States. So from that perspective, I, I know I've read about the, the making of this film. Uh, it was it was important to you and it seems it was important to DJ as well that you were co-equal in terms of uh, the, the sort of the voice being given to this, the, the way the way this was structured. Uh, you know, working with someone who's a, who's a published poet too. So uh, you as an artist and you DJ, I guess, as a wordsmith artist too. Um, talk about that process where where you guys collaborated collaborated on this to make this you know come about. Yeah, yeah. Here's another saying that's that's used often in autistic circles: uh, nothing about us without us. Mm -hmm. And we decided that the only way we could make a film that really had an interior point of view, in other words, a story from the inside out, DJ providing the words and the perspective, was for us to do this as, as partners. So we share editorial control. And the way we would work is I would go out to Iowa. I'm based in Maryland. And I, I would go out to Iowa and uh, spend some time with DJ's family. And I would uh, put together little scenes. Maybe it was DJ uh, in the in the bleachers at a at a football game, or maybe it was DJ in math class. 
and I put put together these these rough scenes and put them online and send DJs a link, and then uh, let him talk about them and let him share with me what he was thinking when things were going on. Uh, anything really he wanted to say, and so he would write and send me back the email words that could then gradually be shaped into a narration. So the, we just went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth all the way through to, to the final tight 72-minute version. And as a person who might come as a writer, I can see where that would be a big benefit to, to know exactly what the subject is thinking as you're trying to help tell their story. So that, I can actually see where that would really be a benefit to someone, you know, like you make, help you make this movie from, the, from that visual perspective to have DJ weighing in the way he did. Oh, sure. And not only is it, was it less work for me, in a, in, in, but I think when people see the film, there are lots of times they'll say, oh, that's what he's thinking, or that's what's happening here. And there are all sorts of little light bulbs that, are, that, that light up during this film because you're hearing from DJ what his thought process is about a particular situation, and often it's miles away from what you think it is. Well, I am definitely looking forward to see the full film. I've seen this two and a half minute trailer on the website, which we'll link to from our website. Uh, for those listening to this, if you want to get us a glimpse of, of Deeds, uh, you can do so and then get your appetite wetted a bit. Uh, come out to link to you on Thursday, September 7th. Not can you see film, uh, but you can also uh, convert. Robert will stay, after, stay around afterwards and take questions. Uh, that's one of the things about the documentary series is that the directors are there to, uh, to, to, to take their questions and how to answer questions just like we've talked about here. Uh, so, Robert, I'm sure that's, that's a good thing for you, too. I mean, this, this, this is something that I'm sure I'm like the other projects perhaps that you've worked on in the past. This is one that I'm sure is just it's become a part of you in some way. Oh, yeah. I mean, we want as many people as possible to see this film. But when we have the opportunity to – when I have the opportunity to be um, in a group of people who are seeing this film and we get a chance to talk about it afterward, it's, it's such a uh, fulfilling uh, – experience for me as well to know and to understand how the film has touched someone. Yes. Yes. That is at the Wayne Theater in Waynesboro, Thursday, September seventh. Uh we will be screening D G and Robert will be there as well. Robert Roy, thank you for your time today talking to us. Oh you're you're welcome. See you there. <laughs>